Hello, and welcome to Enzo's Theater of the World. I'm your host, Enzo Kananen. And I'm Ethan. And today we're going to be talking about Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. So, this is a two-for-one deal this week, because there's not a lot of information about these two wives. So, what do you know about Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife? Um, she was the one who gave him his first son, like, that actually lived past childbirth. Yeah. And then... Anne of Cleves. Uh, and then Anne of Cleves is, you know, uh, the the one who's there for the shortest amount of time. Henry didn't like how she uh, looked. Yeah, Henry, Ethan's sort of what uh, cruelly referred to her as a filler episode in the wa- arc of the wives, but... You're gonna, you're gonna see why I call her that when so, we get to her point later in the in the later half of this episode. Yeah, so to start off, in 1508, Jane Seymour was born to Sir John Seymour and Marjorie Wentworth. They, she was probably born in Wolf Hall, the family residence in Wiltshire, and she had an older brother named Edward, a younger brother named Thomas, and a bunch of other siblings I won't name because they're not important. Jane did not have the courtly education of Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn. She was not taught foreign languages, but she was t- taught uh, dancing, needlework, embroidery, basic arithmetic, household management, uh, literacy in English, but, you know, she didn't have the French style of Anne Boleyn or the complex theological and uh, philosophical training of Catherine of Aragon. Uh, around, around 1529, and I know this is a very big jump, uh, but there's just not a lot of records for her Jane's early life. Jane seems to have got, come to court as a me- Lady in waiting to Catherine of Aragon. Now, this was during the Great Matter, and I've talked about it, the divorce, so much in the Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn episodes that I'm just not going to do it again. And it's possible that sometime around this time, she was going to be betrothed to a country gentleman known as William Dormer, but the betrothal fell through because Dormer's mother didn't think she was a good enough match. You see, the Seymours were well off, but they weren't very high on the social standing, sort of like the Boleyns. And unlike the Boleyns, they were not married to a, uh, a particularly wealthy family in order to make up for this. So in 1533 or 1535 or somewhere in between, w- as soon as Anne became queen, Jane seems to have beco- left Catherine's household and become a member of Anne's household instead. Not much is known about Jane for the for the uh, up until 1535, when we know that Jane's elder brother Edward married Anne Stanhope. Now, he had already been married once before, but he had uh, divorced his first wife for having an affair with his own father, uh, and he doubted, in fact, that his her, his kids by her were, in fact, his, and so he packed her off to a nunnery. And so it's possible this was why William Dormer's mother didn't want him to marry her, because she was like, we are not marrying into that weird incestuous family. So in September of 1535, there was a royal progress, and the King King Henry and Queen Anne visited Wolf Hall, Jane's family home, and it is likely that Jane would have been there, and is it at this time that Henry truly noticed Jane for the first time? He would have seen her around as one of Anne and Cath- before her Catherine's ladies-in-waiting, but we just don't know. Now, in January 7, 1536, Catherine of Aragon died, and a few weeks later, Anne Boleyn miscarried, and it is at this point we get the first mention of Jane in the primary sources. Jane was referred... Jane was Henry's, um, well, she was sort of his mistress. It's like an Anne Boleyn thing where, uh, he tried to persuade her to be his mistress, and Jane said no. She, in, a, in the words of, uh, the Imperial Ambassador Chapuis, uh, she was advised that she, quote-unquote, must by no means comply with the king's wishes except by way of marriage. She is also advised to tell the king how his marriage is detested by the people. So, in a way, I think that we don't see with Anne, because Anne seems to have been the driving factor in her relationship with Henry. Jane seems to have been pushed into the relationship with the king by her family so that they could, like, unseat Anne. And, but Did they have a grudge against her or just wanted to have the opportunity? I think both. Anne was not well-liked. Jane seems to have bit, uh, it wasn't as much of a religious thing, but they did make cause with religious conservatives who, uh, including Nicholas Carew and the Marcus of Ex- of Exeter, you know, they didn't like Anne, and, and, and later Thomas Cromwell because of his own fallings out with Anne. Uh, but what did Jane Seymour really 
how is she perceived by people? I, I mentioned she was pale at the beginning, but did people think she was a great beauty? Well, according to the Imperial Ambassador Chapuis, she was, quote unquote, of middle stature and no great beauty, so fair that one would call her rather pale than otherwise. The said Seymour is not a woman of great wit, but she may have a good understanding. It is said she inclines to be proud and haughty. So, yeah, not a very good impression on some people, but, you know, we're going to be nice here. Uh, we're going to assume Chapuis seems to have been a bit sexist towards every woman he met who wasn't Catherine of Aragon and, Mar and, and the Princess Mary. So, in the spring of 1536, Henry was still trying to make her his mistress because he hadn't thought of giving up the marriage with Anne yet. But then, when, she, when he sent her a purse full of sovereigns, which is a type of coin back then, and a letter, she kissed the letter, returned it unopened to the messenger, and threw herself on her knees before the messenger. And Jane said, I pray you... Tell the king to consider that I am a gentlewoman of good and honorable parents without reproach, and I have no greater riches in the world than my honor, which I will not injure for a thousand debts. If he wishes to make me a present of money, I beg you that it may be when God has enabled me to make some honorable match. And so Jane's very clever here because she's A, asserting her chastity and being like, no, no, uh, don't send me money, it's not proper, but B, saying, I am interested in a husband, so, you know, hit me up right there. And so Henry thought this was very honorable of her, naturally, and he was like, hmm, I won't speak with you in the future except in the presence of your relatives. So he's a very proper man, although he did later have uh, a Cromwell move out of his rooms and you Jane know, move into them. I'm going to cheat on my wife, but I have to do it honorably of course henry is a very strange and contradictory i, I couldn't possibly you know tarnish my real my my cheating relationship with dishonor why that would be improper yeah so anne does seem to have anne was definitely aware of henry's gaining interest in jane and there's some apocryphal stories of anne like seeing that Jane has a neck, a pendant around her neck, and she snatches it and finds it's of the king, and she rips it off her neck, so, a uh, portrait of the king, and she rips it off her neck so hard her fingers bleed, but this is from a later source, but, and, but, like, it's... She might have just been holding it wrong. It, it's also likely, I think it's likely, I don't see any re... I, I think a lot of women, if seeing that their husband was cheating on them, would be violent towards the object of this interest, no matter whether or not it was justified. I don't think we can dismiss that out of hand, but like at the same time, there's just no way to be sure. We are on firmer ground, though, with speculating why Henry might have switched to Jane. Now, in the last episode, I didn't quite go into detail about what Anne looked like, and that's partly because there's no only one contemporary portrait of her, a uh, somewhat defaced metal. But we know that Anne was, had a tan, she was dark-haired with very striking dark eyes, and she was very fiery and very passionate. Whereas Jane, as I said, was pale, probably blonde, blue-eyed, and very um, calm, very tranquil. And, sort of she, and Henry seems to have grown, been growing a bit tired of Anne's uh, moods and somewhat volatile temperament. So, and that's not a bad, and that's not a bad thing in people, obviously. But Henry, you know. Could, was a man of his time, and men at that time, you know, generally. Were. And by temperament, he really just means she doesn't like everything I do. Yeah, he really wanted someone who submitted to him. So, as you'll see later on, it's not a, it's not a, this is not a love marriage. I think in any sense, particular yeah, Henry, sense. That's what love is. Henry but, is. Uh, Henry just not wants anyone someone, else. Henry just wants someone at this point who will do what he wants. So, as, and push out a son or two. Yeah. So. Yeah, and Jane comes from a family known for their son, so he's like, okay, I can get a lot out of this. And so, we're not going to rehash the fall of Anne Boleyn, because uh, I talked about that a lot in the last episode. Just knows she fell, and yeah, but as, as Yeah, and she got beheaded, but as, Jane, as Anne is falling, Jane is rising. You know, she takes up, uh, she they begin the wedding preparations, the swordsman is being sent for before the trial even starts, uh, and, you know... Jane, the day after Anne is beheaded, she gets betrothed. She gets engaged to Henry at uh, Hampton Court. Day of, wait, day of or day after? Day after. Damn, even then, that's tough. It's, it's... I... On the one hand, I think the blame mostly lies with Henry here because he was the one with the power, you know, the power in this relationship. Uh, 
and Jane wasn't, doesn't seem to have been too actively pushing for it. But, like, on the other hand, you know, I, I see, I, I kind of sympathize with Jane here because I'm not sure that he, she had much choice in the matter after her husband or soon to be husband literally judicially murdered his wife. Yeah, and also you don't we don't know everything that happened. We don't know if she was like, Oh, I want to postpone it and he was like, Nonsense, we can go on, it'll be fine. Like we don't know. However so. however Henry however, Henry did uh show some uh kindness towards his dead wife by uh making sure to uh, postpone the actual wedding until 11 days after her execution. So the wedding took place on May 30, 1536 at Whitehall. And on uh, the next week, on June 4, she was proclaimed Queen of England. Uh, now, Jane's family also rose up the ranks. Her brother, Edward Seymour, was created Viscount Beecham. And and things were going pretty good, although Although, uh, just a few weeks after Henry married Jane, he did make a joke about how he had, about how he saw two pretty ladies, and he was like, dang, I wish I had s- seen them before I got married. Which, you know, knowing Jane and that's, how she rose to power is uh, probably to have caused her great anxiety. That's a little mean. Come yeah. on. Yeah, so at this time, Henry's daughter Mary by Catherine of Aragon, who at this point was like 20, was like still holding out against recognizing him as supreme head of the church. And also she didn't recognize that she wasn't, she was illegitimate. And so Henry sent some people to her, including Anne's uncle, the Duke of Norfolk. And they were like, listen, you need to submit or else Henry's very likely to put you on trial for treason and have you executed, which you can do because you're a subject. And the Duke of Norfolk was so mad. He was like, if I were, you were my daughter, I would smash your head against the wall until it was as soft as a baked apple. So Mary seems to have been persuaded by her ally, the Imperial Ambassador Chipuis, that the Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, her cousin, who she had relied on for help, was not going to be protecting her from this. And he was like, listen, I've done all I can, but you can't keep defying your father like this. And oaths made under duress, uh, made, made fo- under force, under threat aren't valid so mary uh submitted she said she signed a document which said that henry was the head of the church he uh rightfully annulled her mother's marriage and that she was illegitimate and mary never forgave herself for it but i would have but the reason she did this is probably it's likely also because jane was pushing for mary to come back to court you see jane seems to have had a real interest in mary and it's not it doesn't seem to have been politically motivated they were just besties they she was pushing for her 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 restoration uh even before she got married and when she was like oh henry can you please bring jane back to court when when you get married henry was like oh you're a fool to think about other people's children you should be focused on the children we're going to have and jane was like oh, but I only look towards your tranquility and the tranquility of your people. So she, you know, knew how to handle him when he was being egotistical and stuff. She, uh, she picked up the roots pretty quickly. Yeah, so in July 1536, Mary came to court. Uh, She was welcomed back to court uh, and received with great honors because, you know, she had finally acknowledged her illegitimacy. uh, Jane gave her lots of gifts and uh, was very close to her. But when Mary uh, came to court, she bowed before her father, and then Henry said to the people in attendance, some of you were desirous that I should put this jewel to death. And then Jane spoke up, uh, because everyone had been stunned into silence, and she said, that were great pity, sir, to have lost your chiefest jewel of England. And Henry thought, and Henry said, nay, nay, and he patted Jane on the belly, and he thought that she was because she, he was like, oh, she's pr- probably pregnant now. I mean, it doesn't take long to get my wife's pregnant. And he said, Edward, Edward, because he had, like, decided on the name already. But poor Mary, seeing that she was going to be replaced in the succession soon, and also, I guess, remembering how she might have been beheaded, uh, fainted. And Henry was like, huh? Why, why did she faint? So, you know, not a great father, that Henry figure. Why did, Mary pa- why did Henry pounce up on Mary? What do you mean? What do you mean? I know. Mean, I'm thinking of someone else. Don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, okay. We're so, talking about Mary. Yeah, we're talking about Mary, his daughter, the 20-year-old by Catherine of Aragon. So, <sighs> ah, okay, yeah. She's just pretty upset about this rotating yeah. form of stepmoms. So, in the meantime, he- as all this was going on, Henry and Cromwell were 
under and, and Cromwell were busy, uh, for lack of a better word, basically sacking the monasteries and dissolving them and, uh, you know, getting all their precious jewels and gifts and basically melting them down for, and putting them into the king's coffers and driving the monks out. And Wait, what exactly is a coffer? Like a treasury, like a chest, I guess. So, like... Why do you have to melt it down, though? Can't you just because, keep like, it as it isn't it rare? I mean, yes, but it's like you can turn it into gold. Because, I like, the gold and the crosses. So, like, they... So, the people of England had been fine, I guess, mostly with the Pope getting removed instead of the church with the king. I mean, after all, the Pope was very far away. And lots of... This, this was beyond people's theological grasp. But the monasteries were a big part of the English landscape. They gave food and charity to the poor. They uh, were... The, the the monasteries were like a part of of local church of uh, local villages they had been around for thou a thousand years and so for henry and, and his men to go and destroy them was something that they wouldn't stand for and under a one one-eyed dude named middle-aged dude named robert ask there was a revolt known as the pilgrimage of grace where 30,000 people marched uh, uh, demanding that uh, all of the Protestant reformers in Henry's council and among Henry's advisors be executed and that he stop, uh, that he stop this monastery dissolving business right now and that he uh, reinstate Mary as heir. And Jane seems to have actually, unlike her you know, brothers who gleefully profited from the sale of monastic lands to the nobility, Jane seems to have been a religious conservative because she... she because at the beginning of the pilgrimage, she went on her knees and, quote-unquote, begged him to restore the abbeys, saying, quote-unquote, perhaps God has permitted this rebellion for ruining so many churches. Henry was furious, and he told her to attend to other things, and that he had often told her not to meddle in his affairs, and reminded her that the, quote-unquote, last queen had died in consequence of meddling too much in state affairs. If what you're wondering about this... This is Henry's most beloved, this is the wife he probably loved the most, and he's talking like this to her. That he's not a very good man. I, I would actually doubt he loved her. He only loved her after death, because, yeah, yeah because she, she, you know, of, she gave him a son, and then she died, and she did and she couldn't, and, and you know, otherwise, she, and this is one of the few times she actually speaks up in politics, even, like, and she's, this isn't like an, an Anne Boleyn thing where she's like an active power player. This is Jane trying to assert her queenly role as intercessor, as someone begging for mercy like the Virgin Mary. And Henry is snapping her down in that traditional role. He's like, no, I am supreme in this r r role too. And so, you know, I don't see Jane as, a, uh, as naturally quiet. I see her sort of as being frightened into silence, as sort of a victim of what we would now call domestic abuse mentally. Uh, living in fear of being beheaded like her uh, predecessor. And so Henry, through a combination of threats, uh, of threats, lies, and just outright violence, managed to crush the rebellion. And Jane was powerless to stop the further despoiling of the abbeys. There's a pointed letter from this nun who's like, please, uh, can you beg Queen Jane to... Uh, to save my convent? And Jane couldn't do anything about it. And you know, this is speculation, of course, but it must have broke her heart. So, an area where Jane did have control, though, was her household. So, Jane, like Anne before, was very concerned that people should, that her ladies in waiting shouldn't rise up and take her place as queen. And so, to th that end, she ha banned the French hoods that Anne wore, these sort of pearled coif hats. With, which showed off the hair, and instead she had her women wear the gable hood, which is sort of like a pentagon hat, which covers all the hair with a coif. However, Jane did keep some French hoods for herself, because, you know, she's Only the queen. Only she gets to be the bad bitch. Yeah, and there's a series of letters where this uh, woman named Lady Lyle from in Calais, the last English town in France, is trying to get her daughter Anne to serve as a lady in waiting to Queen Jane, and Jane's like, "Oh no, you're she doesn't have enough pearls on her girdle. She uh she needs to get rid of this French dress right now." And so you know she's a, she's sort of demanding, but I think it's but she but it's out of a very understandable place. I think. What if she was like? Okay, but send a portrait first. <laughs> like, can't can't make 
ma- got to make did, sure she's she did, only a mid bitch, not like a bad. She bitch. did. She didn't want ugly women serving her, but she did want like attractive, a sort of attractive women because she wants them to compliment her. So in the spring of 1537, after nearly a year of being married, so Henry took a long time to get her pregnant. Uh, Jane found out that she was pregnant, and the court rejoiced uh, because they were like, finally. There is probably going to be a son, and they were a bit worried at this point, Hopefully. naturally. Please. God. In May 1537, Jane felt her child move in her womb, and there were further celebrations. She also announced she had a craving for quail, and so quail was imported from uh, France, from the Netherlands, at great expense for her. Uh, in October 1537, Jane went into labor. Now, it took her two days and three nights to give birth to her baby because the baby seems to have been stuck in the breech position and so it was like and so it was like feet first and so after a bunch of finagling and wrangling around inside of her inside of her jane was finally delivered on october 12 1537 of a healthy baby boy the crowds the people of england and henry of course rejoiced henry went burst into happy tears the boy was named Edward, and he was immediately named Duke of Cornwall and Earl of Chester. Wow, got a head start in life, huh? Heralds were dispatched all over England for the good news, and on October 15, 1537, Edward was cr- baptized at Hampton Court with Mar- the Lady Mary, who, uh, which is Princess Mary's new name because she's illegitimate now, standing as his godmother. Unfortunately, just the next day, Jane became ill with diarrhea, and although her condition improved in the next few days, she su- her condition soon deteriorated, and on October 24, 1537, Jane died. It is traditionally thought that she died from purple fever, which is a sort, which is like, uh, sort of like an infection. It's caused by it's caused by uh, unhygienic conditions after childbirth. However, it may have also been caused by pulmonary embolism or a uh, retained placenta that wasn't because Jane was attended by doctors trained academically. She was not trained attended by female midwives who would have had practical experience. And so it's likely that had she been tr- attended by female midwives or even, you know, modern medical doctors, she would have been fine. But unfortunately, Jane seems to have had the worst death of all the wives. So, on of them, I say worst death, most, not worst, most painful. I, I, there's no sugarcoating this. People are like, oh, Jane was so lucky she she died before Henry yeah, could get like, rid of her. Okay, first of all, three days in birth, horrible. And then you die of, like, diarrhea in feet, no. Being beheaded is better. Um, dying of old age, like Catherine of Aragon, is better. She died uh, of cancer, actually. Oh, she did. It's it's sucks. still better. I, I, well, I, I didn't, how no, long did it go on? Uh, like a month. Okay, maybe it's in competition. Uh, yeah, like Jane, Jane and Catherine of Aragon, they're really up there. So November twelfth, fifteen thirty-seven, Jane was laid to rest in a vault before the high altar of Saint George's Chapel in Windsor. The bells of London tolled for six hours. And that her epitaph read, Here lies Jane, a phoenix who died in giving another phoenix birth. Let her be mourned, for birds like these are rare indeed. Henry went into black for three months after her death, and he declared that he wished to be buried next to Jane in a giant tomb when his time came. However, he only had one son, and although Edward was looked healthy, so did Arthur, his elder brother. Remember, Henry had been the second son, and so Henry realized he needed to marry again, and so... Wait, and, I just have a question. So when did Jane star in that James Bond film? She was Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. No, I'm kidding. Uh, she, Jane Seymour, the actress, uh, named herself after Jane Seymour. Yeah, that's weird, because like, I'm looking up, she's born Joyce Penelope Will- Wilhelmina Frankenberg. And it, it, Jane Seymour is such a weird name to go for. Like, yeah, that's the wife. Yeah, it's strange. So What, what was it about... Um, I can't tell you. I'm not interested in 20, and, and, and I've never watched her in anything. So I, that, that sounds mean, but like, honestly, I haven't. So like. So confusing. So, sent, so yeah, on uh, voice out to look all across Western Europe for a wife. Now, there were two main candidates he had in mind, Christina of Milan and Mary de Guise. Now, Christina of Milan was the 16, a 16 year old widow, and she was actually Danish. She was uh, the niece, I believe, of Charles V. She was a Habsburg. But she didn't marry Henry because her council had concerns about the whole divorced, beheaded, died record of Henry, and they didn't want her to be another divorced woman. So 
Or he, God forbid he break the cycle. Yeah. And so he and so and so he looked at Mary de Guise, but unfortunately Mary de Guise seems to have also been put off by his record, and so she rushed into marriage with his n- nephew, the King of Scotland, and later became the mother to Mary Queen of Scots, so that was fun. Uh so Attention then turned to Germany, where Thomas Cromwell realized, because in 1538, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V and Francis I of France, who had usually been at each other's throats, had now signed a peace treaty, uh, and they had a truce, which allowed them to to be free to gang up on England. And Henry was very startled by this, because thanks to breaking with Rome, he had basically alienated most of all of Catholic Europe. And so... The Pope was very much, the Pope also excommunicated him, like, for good this time. And so this was basically open season on Henry. And so Henry knew he needed allies. And so he looked to Germany, where there was a League of Protestant Princes, who, because the Holy Roman Empire was very decentralized, and so these Protestant princes stood against the authority of the Emperor, but also the Catholic Church. And one of the leaders of this, uh, of this league was a, a, a small German duchy known as Cleves, or Kleve in German, and he, and he real, and he, uh, discovered that the, and Henry discovered that the Duke of Cleves had two daughters, Anne and Amelia, and so he sent Hans Holbein, the port, his court art, his court portraitist, to make portraits of the two, and he, see, and he liked Anne of Cleves's portrait, but it's, Anne of Cleves is often thought about as being, uh, this story is often thought about as Henry being like, ooh, you're so pretty, I want to marry you based on this portrait, even though I've never seen you. However, the evidence does seem to indicate that he did want the marriage to go ahead before he even saw the portrait. And again, that's because of reasons of politics, because Anne of Cleves was A, would A, provide a counterbalance to the combined might of the empire in France, but B, she also grew up in a court with very similar religious beliefs to Henry. Now, Henry was a Catholic at heart, let's be honest here. He believed in the real presence, he believed in uh, clerical celibacy, he was very anxious about, nervous about uh, the Bible in English. He didn't believe in monks, the Pope, or purgatory, but, you know, otherwise he was a Catholic without those. Similarly, Anne had been brought up in a sort of religiously moderate, for lack of a better word, court, uh, although she, her mother was Catholic. And so, you know, the marriage in 15... And so Thomas Cromwell did push for this marriage because he was very enthusiastic about the cause of European Protestantism. And so in 1539, the treaty was... In, in October 4, 1539, the marriage treaty was signed. And on December 11, 1539, Anne re- reached Calais. So Anne had set off from Cleves. And at this point... Her dad had died, so her brother now took over as the new Duke of Cleves. And so Anne's carriage and entourage made their way from Cleves, which is in western Germany, all the way to Calais, passing through French territory and the territory of the emperor, who graciously agreed to, to let this uh, marriage go ahead, because he probably had more foresight than Henry and knew this wouldn't last for long, for reasons I will say shortly. What if he just, like, killed her? Well, that would have probably caused an incident with England, which, and then he would have been able to embargo the Netherlands, which de- relied on trade with England, and it wouldn't be good. The Netherlands was already uneasy, as was. So, Anne remained there in December 1539, uh, you know, learning cards and sort of trying to get accustomed to English culture, because she couldn't leave, go across the channel because of the choppy weather and storms. Now, Anne had been brought up very traditionally. She was born on June 28, 1515, so she shared a birthday with Henry, actually. And she was uh, the daughter of John, Duke of Cleves, and Maria of Ulichburg. And she was born in Dusseldorf, which is now in Germany, but it was in Cleves at the time. Her brother, William, she had a brother, William, as I said, and a sister, Amelia. Anne was not educated that well. She was taught needlework and the basics of running a household like Jane. But unlike Jane, she didn't even get music or dancing lessons because this was considered very uh, frivolous at the Cleves court. She could only speak and read and write in German. She didn't know French or English, and they had to teach her English as she was going along. What was their plan for her? I don't really see I think they she... were going to marry her off inside of Germany, to be honest. 
I don't think they planned on her ever making as this good of a match. Indeed, it seems. Indeed, and by all accounts, seems to have been excited that she's going to marry the king of England. They look. They took one look at her when they gave birth, and like, yeah, this one's not a winner. We'll <laughs> we'll try again next time. Because she seems to have been excited when she married. Heard she was going to marry the king of England because after all, her sister Sybil had married the elector of Saxony, but he was only an elector of the Holy Roman Empire. She was marrying a real king. You know, it's a step up. And I guarantee you Sybil was probably prettier. Oh, Sybil seems to have been very pretty, according to her portrait, and she... But, you know, anyway. So, like, I just want to say, it's quite telling that whenever they bring up, like, the, por the, the big portraits of the wives that everyone uses, there's a reason why Anne of Cleves is it, the only one in, like, front facing okay, as but, compared to three forts. Okay, but the reason that is is probably because Anne had a long nose, but so did Jane Seymour and Anne Boleyn, so that wouldn't explain Henry's reaction to her later on. She uh, so her Maybe uh, maybe Anne of Cleves just had an she was tall long nose. She was tall so what did she look like? Why are we talking about this? She was tall, blonde, solemn looking, a bit older than looked a bit older than she was. The French ambassador thought she was thirty. She was actually twenty four when she came to England. Oh that's rough. Uh, but everyone seemed to like how she looked, you know, no one complained about her being, like, hideous or anything. So, on December 27, 1539, Anne was finally able to travel across the channel, and her ship reached Dover, and b by New Year's Day, she was at Rochester, but Henry, and it, she was going to make her way to London, but Henry was very impatient, and so he decided to ride in a disguise with a number of his privy chamber, to Rochester and present her with gifts, including like furs and stuff. And so he burst into her. And so as she was watching a bull baiting match, which is a a bull baiting match. That's where you poke a bull and try to get. Yeah, it. and and he he uh burst into her room, is disguised as a messenger, and he gave her the gifts and he kissed her. And she, according to this, according to one source, was quote unquote marvelously abashed. Which yeah, just place yourself in Anne's shoes at the moment. This is Henry trying to reenact the sort of disguises and masquerades of his youth, because Henry's very fond of disguises. He and did also, this with more Catherine... importantly, likes to act like he's younger than he is. He did this with Catherine of Aragon, he did this with Anne Boleyn, but Henry at this point is 49 years old, he is over, he is very overweight, he is, uh, he's like actually morbidly obese by this point, like there's no getting around that, he was like 300 plus pounds, uh, with a stinking ulcer on his leg, and... Stinking? Like, really stinky? Stinking because it keeps, like, oozing pus and stuff. It's not very... You know... It's it's the result of that fall back in January I know that you have to keep up a royal appearance, but if I was just walking around the court, I'd probably... He bandaged it, don't worry. No, I, I, I would keep it exposed in the... Like, not exposed, but, like, I would not keep put... Like, you know, like, pull up your, like pants sleeve so that you can get some air. Ah, uh, I guess. They kept like, cauterizing it, which I don't know how much good that did it. Either that or just, like, accept it, amputate it, give him a peg lug. Now so you, anyway, how would you... you need to really reinforce it, because so, he's pretty heavy. So Yeah, so Henry, this is the Henry VIII that we are all familiar with, the very fat and sort of stinking, you know, sort of horrifying looking old man with the, uh, like prematurely aged with small slits for, for eyes, like small eyes sunken into his face. So if this man came into your room disguised as a messenger and you didn't know he was the king and he kissed you, I pretend you were a 24-year-old German woman who has been trained to well, be very I, decorous. I'd know he wasn't the messenger because he's too fat to be a messenger, so... But maybe he's a servant of some sort, so... What, what? I'd fire him if he was my money. You got... How's he supposed to, like, get you stuff? Like, he... <laughs> but what, my point is, wouldn't you be startled and, in fact, deeply yeah, terrified Yeah, I, th I think I'd actually be more horrified because I would not believe that he actually even worked for the king. So... <laughs> it's just some sicko that, like, killed the messenger so, and stole so, his clothes. So Anne was very polite towards this, quote-unquote, messenger, and she sort of squirmed and turned away from him and looked back out of the window and didn't try to pay him no attention. And Henry was very mad... Because what Anne did was he shattered his self-image because he had been thinking, oh, I'm so handsome, I'm so young still, I can still keep up with my these young men. And Anne looked at him without flattery. She looked at him and sort of with her terrified, horrified gaze basically told him, you are aged, you are not attractive anymore, You know who are you?
I don't think it was that. I think Henry's literally making this up in his mind. It's not that, Henry. It's that you're like a stranger who just kissed her out no, of because nowhere. No, Henry, because Henry was following in the traditions of courtly love. And so he uh, it thought that Anne would see through the disguise. I don't... Only- because, like, she, he thought she would be trained to see through the disguise and be like, oh, it's you, Henry, my true love, and then she would swoon and they would... I don't understand how this is supposed to work. Is this something they did? They did it in England. That's what he did with Catherine of Aragon and Anne Boleyn, but I don't think... Yeah, but that's different, I though. don't think they did that in Cleves at all, so I don't understand why he... Also, I feel like back then he... You know, I feel like this is one of those traditions where, like, it's not really hard. Like, they're dressed better than the normal messenger and you kind of already yeah. know what he looks like. She didn't. He did not send like a portrait over or anything. Yeah. So he Henry, Henry he got a portrait sure. of Anne. I'm not sure Anne got a portrait he was of Henry. Just, like so sure that his like royal aura would shine through. <laughs> but only thing so, that re- only aura he had was the stinky aura of his ulcer. So he returned this time in royal purple, and Anne now knelt down and was very and it was like, oh my, oh my, and she stammered in German something about, oh, you know, I'm so sorry. And Henry was like, no, no, it's okay. And he was very outwardly polite towards her. But when he left, he told Crumble that he had not been well handled, and he commented that. I see nothing in this woman as men report of her. He was very cranky about this. And he was like, alas, who should men trust? And he Uh, urged... I I don't know, Henry, that kind of sounds like your fault. And he urged Crumble to find a loophole in the marriage contract that would allow him to not marry Anne. However, the politics at the time would not allow for him to just suddenly abandon this Cleves allies, especially if he didn't want to get ganged up on by the Holy Roman Empire and France together. So... Wow, he was real quick to give up. You couldn't even try a little more? Yeah, no, he was like, Is there no other remedy but that I must needs against my will put my neck in the yoke? He, he's, so he's acting Henry, like he's you a cow. Just, Henry, you just met her. Yes. Calm down. So he really wanted to get out of the marriage. He summoned the Cleves ambassadors and was like, You better get out. Didn't she have a pre contract? Eng- she, wasn't she engaged when she was like below the age of consent? Uh, and when she was like, 12 or something to the son of the uh duke of lorraine and they were like yeah but that was called off and and he's like okay do you have the documents to prove then they're like not right now we're in england we need to get them for the archives what is the wedding anyway and, they're, and henry's like in a few days and they're like that's impossible henry really stressing out his lawyers isn't he so on january 6 1540 the reluctant Henry married the probably ju- the, the probably not as reluctant Anne of Cleves. People think that she w- she would have probably been frightened, but at the same time, she was brought up to make a good marriage, and so and she, also this is a very exciting opportunity to for become her queen of England. She's, you know, kind of okay looking. Yeah. So she she did arrive late at the wedding, funnily enough. So maybe she was having second thoughts, but she did come around eventually. And after the marriage reception, the couple retired. But that night, Henry couldn't consummate the marriage. He said it, He said later to his doctor that it wasn't because he was impotent. No, no, he had had two wet dreams in the night. No, it was because uh, she, it was because he had quote unquote felt her belly and breasts and thought she was no maid. He was struck to the heart and left her as good a maid as he had found her. Okay, so uh, what you mean, Henry, is that you felt this woman. Couldn't get hard, and then you came in your pants twice. I don't see how this is He also way- claimed she had evil smells about her. No, Henry, that's your leg. <laughs> Come on, man. You literally have an ulcer. It's not her. She showered. I don't know if you did. She. He also claimed that uh, he could tell she wasn't a virgin because of the slackness of her breasts and other tokens. Which, you know, I don't know how you... As we'll see in the Catherine Howard episode, Henry's virgin detecting abilities are not yeah, that Henry good. Yeah, Henry is really... He's, he's gone basically, what, 0 for 5... over 4 at this point? Come on, man. He thought Catherine of Aragon later... Well, he decided Catherine of Aragon wasn't a virgin, which she probably was. He claimed that Anne had been sleeping around when she probably wasn't. He thought Jane was a virgin, which she probably was. And now he's saying Anne of Cleves is a, uh, isn't a virgin when... It's really inconceivable, despite the theories of horrible writers like Alison Weir, that, you know, she, they're, they're like, she's like, oh, you know, she and got pregnant with her cousin's child. No, that's BS. You made it to sell a novel. How do you know shame in yourself? Anyway, so... She doesn't, by the way. So, in this, so Anne was trying to get adjusted to the English court at this time, despite the con- lack of consummation. And 
you know, people seem to like Anne. You know, she, people were skeptical at first because she wasn't a great, f from a great country, like a great powerful country like Catherine of Aragon was. But, you know, they came around. And one of her ladies-in-waiting was a woman, was a teenager known as Catherine Howard, the niece of the Duke of Norfolk. And so Henry became very interested in her, probably first as a mistress, but then the tide shifted because in April 1540, Henry, Henry the, the alliance between Francis I and Charles V began to break apart. And so it looked like Henry England would be able to ally with one of them now, so they wouldn't be isolated anymore. Additionally, Anne's brother William, the Duke of Cleves, was now chomping at the bit of the Emperor, and he was basically uh, threatening to attack the Emperor, who was way bigger than him, mind you, and had access to more troops, over a territory that he had an inheritance to, nor known as Gelders. And so, basically, Henry before this was put in a position where he had to suck it up, and, you know, basically try to impregnate Anne, you know, as most royals did. Most royals did not marry for love. Henry, however, was now free to get rid of Anne because he no longer needed her. And so that's what he did. That's why it took, that's why the marriage lasted as long as it did, because he, six months isn't a long time. I'm just but, imagining, like, it's so funny to me, like, here. Uh, he would continue to sleep with Anne without any sexual contact for months. This is after the yeah, first night. Yeah, no. I just imagine him, like, just trying and, like, closing his eyes and trying to think, Other wives, your previous wives! <laughs> <laughs> Her ladies-in-waiting would later testify during the divorce trial that they did a know whether Anne, ask Anne whether she was pregnant, and she was like, no, I'm not. And they're like, oh, you're a virgin. And she's like, how can I be a maid and sleep every night with a king? When he comes to bed, he kisses me and takes me by the hand and bids me good night, sweetheart. And in the morning, he kisses me and bids me farewell, darling. Is this not enough? Her lady in waiting, Lady Rutland, said, Madam, there must be more, or it will be long ere we have a Duke of York, which all this realm most desireth. And then said she was content and that she would know no more. <laughs> Dang, Some she... people think that Anne didn't know what sex was, but I think it's more likely she was trying to protect her. I think it's likely that she was being nice, and she was actually trying to not let people know that Henry couldn't get it up with her. Because, of course, she wouldn't have known what Henry's official story was, that he thought she was ugly. No, all that she could see, all that Anne could see, was that Henry was failing to get aroused by her, or get aroused at all. And so it's likely that Anne was very kind and trying to sort of act like a fool so that Henry's reputation wouldn't be tarnished. No, I think it's funny if she just did not know what sex was. Okay, but it's also unrealistic because even the most strict woman would have taught her daughter what, how to, how to, what to expect on a marriage night. You know, this was expected and sort of a duty of mothers at the time. So, you know, I'm not buying it. Well, maybe in the whole, whole English thing, she was kind of lost and... Like she that's knew, true. I she knew the penis in barrier. German, but she didn't know that's what the true. penis was in English. <laughs> so Henry just trying to, hey, let's have sex. And like, eh. She was rapidly learning English at this time, though, but I, I don't remember at what month this came. So, Maybe Henry kept using euphemisms, and yeah. she was like, German, she had no idea what he was talking about. So in June 1540, Cromwell, who's... Who, Thomas Cromwell was arrested on charges of heresy and treason. He was fatally weakened by... He was not he was not fatally weakened. He was weakened by the Cleves marriage, his position was. And then his enemies moved in and accused him of being too much of a Protestant and also, you know, and that really... And, and plotting to kill the king. And Henry believed it and he sent Cromwell to the Tower of London. Around this same time, Anne was sent to Richmond Palace. And a few weeks later, she was told that her marriage to Henry was being investigated due to a pre-contract with Francis of Lorraine. And Anne had been queen for six months. And she was like, oh my god, I'm not going to be queen anymore. I failed my country, I failed my family. And she actually fainted. And, and just a few days later, they had managed to, uh, despite the protests of the Cleves ambassador, Karl Horst, they had managed to corral a bunch of evidence, including the pre-contract and Henry not sleeping with Anne. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's just not the funniest idea. Like, amidst all of this, like, no, don't, don't, don't go through the divorce, come on. What if, like, there was, like, a porn parody where it's, yeah, you get one shot, otherwise I'm leaving you forever. That's horrible, but there was a rumor later on. Okay, I'll, t I'll tell you, but there was a rumor later on. So, 
just three days after she was told her marriage was being investigated, Henry had managed to get all of the bureaucracy and paperwork together to have the convocation, which was a church body, declare his marriage to Anne null and void because of the pre-contract and the non-consummation. Hey, Henry was preparing for a while. And so Anne, when she heard this, said, uh, is reported to, quote unquote, have made such tears and bitter cries that it would break a heart of stone. So she was not very happy with this. But when she was, you know, asked whether she would accept the divorce, she she realized she had no other choice that she gave in. And Henry, so I'm just reading this. Apparently, Henry's physician was called Dr. Butts. Yes. That's funny. So, and for what it's worth, got a very good deal in the annulment. She, in exchange for uh, agreeing to the divorce, received Hever Castle, Richmond Palace, and a Dang, she got Anne's house. Yeah, she and and she got a very lavish, uh, a, a pension, and and she was got the honorary title of the queen's beloved, the king's beloved sister, and she was given precedence over all women in England except his wife and daughters, and and was often invited to court. And that's pretty good. Yeah, although although Anne naturally, you know, seems to have considered herself, you know, she 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 she, she wasn't too happy about. She was still in private a bit miffed about the whole not being queen anymore thing, even if she was invited to court in Christmas 1540 where she danced actually with Catherine Howard, her former lady in waiting and now and now queen. And Catherine was very kind to her and she actually gave her some puppies, which I thought was cute. Unfortunately, Catherine would be beheaded two years later. Yeah. And See, when this, this is why I don't get why Anne was so upset. You surely remember what happened, right? She would never have been beheaded, though. She would have just been... Yeah, ignored. I know, but he's very, clearly going to be a very tough dude to uh, deal well, with. Well, no, also, well, also Henry insisted on reading all of her letters that she sent out of England to yeah. her family in Cleves. Uh, she's being an... Aw- I think she's not really understanding how nice this is. Your life is set and you don't have to deal with the king. I mean, that's kind of a win-win. And you get, like, an unofficial title. And it's, it's, you're getting, like, perks. Like What I'm trying to stress here is that Anne is not as she was, the real Anne of Cleves did not behave like she did in Six the Musical where she has a party palace in Richmond. No, she seems to have been a bit actually concerned that, about how Henry, she seems to have been genuinely sort of hurt by her rejection, and she was trying to be a good queen. And in the, as Kat, when Catherine Howard fell, she, her brother, and the Cleves ambassador all asked Henry if he would take her back. And Henry was like, even if I had to marry again, I would never marry you, which I thought was a bit he, rude. He, he has never said that about any of his other wives, so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ka- yeah, so, yeah, so, ha- yeah, so. Anne actually outlived Henry, and he also she also outlived his last wife, Catherine Parr. She lived to see her stepdaughter Mary become queen. Uh, and by this point, you know Anne was struggling a bit financially, probably because she had developed a love for gambling and drinking. Because which you know you'd think that being German, she would have been more you know dr- drank more, but she doesn't seem to have been indulged too much in drinking you until know, she came to England. The drinking isn't so bad. The gambling is where it's. Anne, but, att- yeah. So Anne. He- yeah. You, it's hard to spend a lot on, like, drinking, but, like, especially mm-hmm. just for you, but, like, gambling? Yeah. So, Anne attended, Anne of Cleves... Did she go broke? Uh, no, I don't think so, although she did uh, ask for money a lot. Anne of Cleves attended Mary's coronation, Mary the First coronation at Westminster Abbey, along with her other stepdaughter, Elizabeth. However, Mary would distrust her after White's rebellion, which is a rebellion against Mary's proposed marriage to the Prince of Spain, Philip. And... Although Mary Anne was probably not involved, uh, she her asso- close association with Elizabeth nevertheless meant that she was not invited to court as for the rest of her life, which, as it turned out, would only be three years, because in 1557, Anne became sick, probably with cancer, and on July 16, 1557, Anne of Cleves died at the Palace of Chelsea. She had lived, she, she had not lived the longest out of Henry's wives, but she had outlived all of the wives and Henry. She had outlived Henry by nine by ten years, uh, and a few weeks later she was buried at Westminster Abbey. Her grave is a bit hard to find nowadays. It's actually, it's actually opposite the side of Edward the Confessor's shrine. But her epitaph, but but her epitaph reads simply Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557. The chronicler Holinshed called her a lady of right commendable regard, courtesy gentle a good 
courteous, gentle, a good housekeeper, and very bountiful to her servants. So, yeah, that is the life of Jane Seymour and Anne of Cleves. So, what are your impressions about the two women now that we've sort of gone through their lives? You know, I think... Okay, well, I, I still feel that Jane is, like... I really tried to tell you as much as we know about her. There's, there's just, just not lot. much to talk about Jane. Like, she was fine, got yelled at a bit, and then died in childbirth. Yeah. And then, like, Anne... Okay, I still stick my Anne. Was like, like, what really happened at the end of the day? Uh, she got married for political reasons. The political tides turned. Henry didn't, never liked her in the first place, so he yeah, divorced like, her. Political reasons, then the political reason was solved, and then she got divorced and had fat stacks for the rest of her life. Yeah, so... I mean, good for her, I guess. So, like, we've seen two-thirds of the wives now, and so what... We've seen four out of the six wives, I mean. So who out of the first four wives is your favorite? That's still Anne. Anne Boleyn. Yeah, okay. She's cool. Yeah, so next week, we are not going to be talking about the wives. We're going to be doing a break from the tutors for a yeah, bit. Yeah, I feel like um four straight in a row might have been over. Three, actually. So we did three because this is uh, the two and one. No, episode. I'm including like if we were going to continue with the Oh, next yeah, no. Three, four would be too much. We're stopping at three out of five. So we're three fifths of the way through this series. Next time, we're going to be talking about pseudo archaeology and we're going to be talking about various crazy stuff that people have said with archaeology and. It's it's just madness. There's ancient aliens, but there's also, like, people who are said to have discovered the Americas before Columbus, yeah. you know. Although, Jews, to be fair, you know, most archaeology for a while was basically pseudo-archaeology, so. Yeah, but I'm so excited to talk about that, and yeah, so, yeah. You just got to be a, an archaeologist if you had enough money to purchase explosives. Yeah, so, uh... Brushes? Shovels? Oh my god, hi, we don't actually, need. Man. We don't need that dynamite and a pickaxe so yeah that's it for this week uh and see you next time goodbye bye